Okay, welcome everyone. Um, all right, this is th this workshop today will be more about practice than than just lecture. But as the, was the case with last night, um, I welcome open discussion. We don't need to have a formal section for question and answer. If if something sounds like it needs more ex explanation or expounding, <laughs> please just I, I either ch either just uh, offer offer some some uh, a question or a concern or to raise your hand, I, I, either of the two. But today will be more practice. And when I say practice, meditation is a practice, right? Breathing techniques are practices. So that's what we'll do. And it will include some theory as well, quite a bit of theory, actually. I want to give you all the information and data um, as it relates to the background and the reasons behind the practices that we do and how they can ultimately enhance your life because that is the purpose of the whole thing. Why do yoga? Why study? Well, it's to make our lives a little bit better. So, um, By way of introduction, since we have someone who wasn't here last night, what is your name, please? Beth. Beth. Good to meet you, Beth. I'm Paul Benedict. This is Terry Hunt. We come from Las Vegas, the, the nice warm Mojave Desert. And as I mentioned last night, we left 95 degrees and came to 45 degrees. It dropped 50 degrees over the course of our plane flight. So we're thrilled to be here, though, and see some greenery. We don't have a lot of that in Vegas. It's mostly brown, but that's OK. The desert's beautiful. And we're thrilled to be here. So we, we thank the Detroit Lodge and Sandy and Mary Jo and everyone who was instrumental in bringing us here. And we hope to come back again um, for, for more next time. So we have co-authored a book. And we have a copy up there. <coughs> It's called Ancient Wisdom for a New Age, a Practical Guide for Spiritual Growth. And I want to reemphasize what I said last night, that everything we teach, we want to make sure it's practical and usable today and now. And that's why the subtitle is there. And it's, um, so this book is available. Today it is. But we, <laughs> we thank you, everyone, for, for supporting us with that. We can ship books very easily here, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. No, soft, um, I actually I should have changed the ratio of soft to hard that I brought, but, or that we brought. But, but no, this, the soft covers and then the hard covers, there's also an e-book an, an e in all three major formats, um, Kindle, Nook, and iBook. Those are available as well on Amazon. Come with some business cards too? We have a, an email sign-up sheet actually right there. And if, if anyone wants a book, just write book next to your email address and we'll we'll make that happen for sure but so oh sure that just yeah write book and we'll coordinate okay. for sure thank you that's wonderful all right any other notes before we get started at all anyone here yeah. okay all right lots of um, lots of fun things to talk about in practice but before we do that let's do an opening meditation we always like to calm our vibes and coordinate ourselves before we start so let's please sit comfortably. And as I mentioned yesterday, there's no special seat for meditation and pranayama. Only requirement is, there are two requirements. One is that you're comfortable, and the second is that your spine is erect. Right? Uh, sitting in a seat makes it easy because you can just put the lower back against the back of the chair and sit tall. So go ahead and do that. Make sure that you don't, you're, you're in a position that you won't need to fidget or move for the next just several moments. It won't be too long. And just start to notice your physical body. And just relax everything that doesn't need to be engaged. And so that means just releasing any tension in the pelvic area. We tend to squeeze muscles there and just relax that. The only muscles that are active are those that are supporting your spine. Allow your chin to become parallel to the ground. The very top of your head is roughly over the base of the spine. Allow your shoulders to just relax. Start to become aware of the natural inflow and outflow of the breath. And it doesn't hurt to continually check back in with the physical body and make sure that you didn't flex or tense something. We tend to do that 
you know, inadvertently. So notice if your shoulders are lifting. Notice if your legs are engaged or your feet or your toes are flexed. Relax everything. The facial muscles. Relax those. Relax your lips and tongue. So one of the components of pranayama breathing, so keep your eyes closed and just listen, is called ujjayi breath, and we'll talk about the definition of that. So in order to engage ujjayi breathing, just engage a, a slight constriction of the windpipe, just a very subtle narrowing of the air passageway. So if you are familiar with anatomy, it's the area around your epiglottis, glottis, and the trachea, around the trachea. And there will be an audible sensation, it sounds like wind or waves, or Darth Vader. Today is May the 4th. So you should be able to hear the breath as it enters the body and as it exits the body. You should also feel a subtle vibration. So let's heighten our awareness to that sensation. Let's become attuned to just that subtle vibration in the throat. You might even liken it to the ocean waves as they gently crash against the beach and then recede again. Notice if the inhale and exhale are of different qualities and intend to make them even. The Sanskrit name for this is samavritti, same movement of the inhale and exhale. So the same length, inhale and exhale. The same strength, Inhale and exhale. If you notice that there are any rough spots or catches or hiccups in the breath, whether on the inhale or exhale, just have the intention to smooth both out. So once you've resolved any rough spots in the breath, you should be breathing rhythmically and smoothly and subtly. And now I'd like to draw your attention to the nostrils the inside of the nostrils. It's a part of our body that we don't normally pay attention to. The skin is quite sensitive inside the nose once you actually become aware of it. And begin to notice that you can sense the air inside the nostrils as you breathe in and breathe out. Just be aware of the physical air moving across the skin of the nostrils, entering the body. And exiting the body. And trace the path of the air 
as it moves through the sinuses and down the windpipe into the lungs. Follow the, tra the path of the air as it moves in the body and out of the body. Do another body scan, make sure nothing has tensed or flexed. Continue to be relaxed in the physical body and just be aware of the air. Maintain the gentle ujjayi constriction in the throat. And now notice that there's an energetic component to the physical air. There's a counterpart. It's called prana. The pranic aspect of the air is the subtle, the subtle nature. It's almost an intelligence. And there's that too that enters the body. So intend to increase your sensitivity and notice that there's more to the air than just the physical molecules of oxygen and gases. Become resonant and sensitive to the energetic component of the air as it enters the body. You might sense this as light. Or as a stream of energy, perhaps. As it moves through the nostrils and into the body. For the final stage of this initial practice, I'd like you to bring your attention between the eyebrows and slightly back into the head. And become aware of the bridge of the nose and notice that the two streams of air that enter at the nostrils converge roughly at this spot, the bridge slightly back into the head. The two streams of air entering the nostrils meet like at the tip of a triangle, the top of a triangle. Hold your awareness there and sense that place as a collection point of energy as you inhale. It might be challenging to sense inside your head, but just do your best. Perhaps you can think of it as the midbrain area. Each time you inhale, energy enters through the nostrils and converges at that point. You might see it as a ball of light or a flame. Or just sense a presence there. Please continue just a moment longer. Sense energy collecting in the head.
Now relax the technique and just be still. Please join me in an OM. Inhale. Oh. Okay, and please come back in, in, in your own time. How was that? Just fine. Were, okay, good. Were you able to sense a presence in the head and follow the stream of the air a little bit or a lot of bit? Good. A little, little bit? Okay, good. Yeah, it's challenging at first. Like, how do you become aware of the point in your head? You can't really touch it. You can't really feel it physically. Yeah, you can do that. Um, yeah. Ah. To your nose or to your mouth when you breathe out. Mm. There are in near infinite number of methodologies. Mm -hmm. Different traditions, different purposes, different intentions. Breathing in and out through. Hmm? That's the yeah. thing. Each one has a different purpose. Yeah. There are times when you want to breathe out through your mouth because that creates a different vibration than. Yeah. A lot of times mouth breathing will increase heat in the body and it will create a more energetic effect sometimes. It just depends on the intention. A lot of times nostril breathing is used for calming effects and for relaxation and peace and mouth can be to energize you and charge you up. But different techniques provide different results. Yeah. Did you stay with one or the other? I was mixing them. For one practice, depending, have an intention for that practice. If you're going to do a five minute practice, have an intention and do that. But if you're for example, in the morning, if you want to charge up your body, maybe some Kapalabhati, <laughs> we'll, we'll, work, we'll talk about that. That's mouth breathing. Uh, but in the evening before bed, perhaps just nostril breathing. There are m many different energetic effects. And Sandy, if you have any input, please, please share as well. I sure. really appreciate the way that you approached Ujjayi. Okay. Your Was the Darth Vader comment that you liked? No. <laughs> <laughs> These things yeah. Darth Vader in the ocean. Yeah. How it's like, Common. Yeah. Oh. Into a group and they were like, yes, May 4th, you're a little early. Okay. <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> so do I, do I get to explain it? Yeah, just, okay. Just th think, think about a lisp. How would someone say, may the force be with you, if they had a lisp? May the force be with you. <laughs> may the oh, fourth. Oh, <laughs> 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 may fourth. <laughs> Isn't that hilarious? It's pretty funny, I know. But may fourth. <laughs> Yeah. And I don't get, when you live in a certain area, you hear, it's like cultural, so we explain certain kinds of things in the same way. Yes. And so you're not from here, so I got to hear it in the way that maybe it's a cultural thing there, or maybe these are your words, but I really appreciate the approach, the words, the extra um, touch to, with the uh, triangle through the, so this is new. Good. This is net new that I haven't heard yet, so it's good. Use it. Please use it. Please use it. I didn't make it up. No, I didn't make it up. I'm picking what works for me and using that. Yeah, definitely. Sure. So in your constriction of oh. the airway, yes. is that you do with both inspiration and expiration? Yes. Okay. Yes. Abdominal breathing. <coughs> you don't always do that. Now, that's another thing I was taught. You push the air out. Your stomach muscles, you know, push it out the diaphragm. I've got lung problems, so that's why I'm oh. kind of more particular. Sure. You know, Ah, sure, of course, and but not always, it depends on focusing on diaphragmatic breathing it energizes the body a little bit more as well. It can be as subtle or as intense as you choose to make it. And yes, there's there's 
a lot of teachings on the different bandhas, we call them. A bandha is an energetic lock using the diaphragm to pull in and up. And that can intensify your pranayama practice. But yes, if you need that in order to actually exhale all the air, it's important to do that. We want the breathing to be complete. When we inhale, complete lung breath, exhale, complete lung breath. So if you need to engage the diaphragm more, yes, of course. Yeah. Specific, pra <laughs> well, we, <laughs> we, we talk a lot about understanding, understanding what we do and what we need to make our life better. And that, that's a central theme in our, in our book, but specific pranayama techniques, no, not, not, not in our book. Speaking of books, though, I want to give you some background on where a lot of my teaching and, and, and explanations come from. And on your handout here, I have a few listed under recommended texts at the, at the top of the first page there. The first one is this book here called Light on Pranayama by Iyengar. So this guy Iyengar um, was one of the fathers of modern yoga here in the Western world and in, in Europe and, and United States. And he, his, first, his first popular book was called Light on Yoga. And that came out, I believe, in the 60s, if I'm not mistaken. And it was a, a very good, relatively easy to understand book on physical hatha yoga. And then he followed it up with, with this book, Light on Pranayama. And the reason why he's called both of his books Light on XYZ, he takes that from an ancient text, which is, so the next bullet point there, you see Hatha Yoga Pradipika. That book is one of the seminal or main major texts on physical yoga. And Hatha Yoga Pradipika means illuminating Hatha Yoga or shining light on or explaining or making clear hatha yoga. So that word pradipika, light on, and that's where he gets his, his titles from, and that's where I got the title for this workshop, Light on Pranayama. I'm hearkening back to the pradipika. So for those of you who remember last night, we were talking a lot about the Yoga Sutras of Patanjali. So the Yoga Sutras of Patanjali and the hatha yoga pradipika, which I don't have a copy of, but maybe we do here. Is there a hatha yoga? The, the Yoga Sutras of Patanjali and the Hatha Yoga Pradipika are like the yin and yang of yoga. The Yoga Sutras of Patanjali refer to the, the yin aspect or the mind mental yoga, and the Hatha Yoga Pradipika would be the, um, the, the, the yang or the physical, the phys all the physical techniques and methods. All right, I, I see this book right over there, the IK Time. Oh, nice, cool. So the Light on Pranayama. The Hatha Yoga Pradipika, all about physical practices, asana, physical poses, breathing techniques, purification. That's all in the Pradipika. Then Pure Yoga, the third one there, by Yogi Pranavananda, that's a, um, a, a commentary on another physical yogic text called the Garantha Samhita. Not quite as important, in my opinion, as the Pradipika, but it's there as well. There, there are several scriptures or texts on, on physical yoga. And we have a fourth one here. Okay, this book is very, it's smaller and easy to, easier to read, called *The Path of Fire and Light: Advanced Practices of Yoga*. This is by a guy named Swami Rama, who started the Himalayan Institute. This book is very, very important in terms of pranayama because it's all about breathing techniques. That's what the whole book is about, similar to *Light on Pranayama*, but a different approach. And I love how he calls these advanced practices of yoga. No asana in this book. There's no warrior poses, no downward dogs. It's all about breathing techniques. And he says these are the advanced yogic techniques, learning to breathe properly, breathe energetically. And there are some practices in here which, in, <laughs> which teach you to hold your breath for four minutes. Now, I'm, I'm nowhere near that level, and I don't know that most human beings are near the level to hold their breath for four minutes. But when you can do that consciously, the amount of prana that's built in the body is supposedly tremendous, and he teaches it. And he, this guy is actually really interesting. He was medically examined on some of his siddhis that he could do. And it's controversial, of course, because I don't know how medically proven it is, but he was tested. He had ways to do things like stop his heartbeat or flutter his heart on, on, at will, and he is actually a, even able to increase and decrease his body weight 
Now, I know it's controversial, but he was tested. So Sidhis, who knows if that's a, a usable Sidhi, if you can make yourself lighter or heavier, but I guess if you can do that at a high level, you could eventually float. Who knows? But this guy is interesting, Swami Rama, if you're curious. So he wrote this book on advanced practices of yoga, all about breathing techniques. So some of my instruction today comes from this, comes from this, um, and a book that most of you, or some of you might be familiar with. I saw it over there on the shelf, The Chakras by Leadbeater. There are so many books on chakras and nadis. We'll talk about that. So many. This is one of the better books, in my opinion, on, on chakras. So the reason why chakras are important is because the energetic component of the air, which I mentioned in our meditation, is prana. And the chakras are made of prana. They're all about receiving and transmitting energy to the, to the body. So chakras by, by Leadbeater. All right, let's define this thing called pranayama. So I'm going to go up to the board here. It's another compound Sanskrit word. Prana. And it's actually ayama. But one of the A's is taken away when it's put together. Uh, so it's only one word. But one point. Oh, Whenever sure. You combine as oh, yeah. A word ending with A and one beginning with A, it becomes a long A. Uh -huh. And that's why we have those lines again. Pranayama, and one of those A's goes away when it's put together. Thank you, Terry. Does anyone remember from our talk last night what the first limb of the Ashtanga yoga path is? The first of the eight limbs? Sandy doesn't get to answer. She knows this. <laughs> so the eight limbs, they started with something. In the, what is it? The, yama. the, ya the yamas, exactly, yamas. And the actual literal translation of yama means restraint. In the context of Raja Yoga, it, it means morals or ethics, but that's a form of, 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 of restraint of your, of your character, right? So when yama or ayama is applied to prana, what are we doing with prana? Restra restra restraining it, exactly. So the actual definition of pranayama is to restrain our prana. That's the literal definition of it. We're restraining prana. Now, to do that, there are lots of methods, lots of techniques and, and teachings on how to restrain your prana. So inhaling, exhaling, holding the breath after an inhale, holding the breath after an exhale, which is significantly more challenging to do sometimes than holding it after an inhale. But we're restraining our body's energy, and we do that through, through breathing techniques. Specific question. Sure. So you're talking about the breath and the prana. The breath carries prana, is that Correct. Sense? Mm -hmm. And then you, when you were doing the, the mm -hmm. meditation, you be aware of it. I think that's very, I mean, for me, probably any beginner would be impossible. Right? Hard to do. Well, it takes an intention first. It takes an awareness. So how about our, our body's constitution here? So most of us who are studying spiritual things have an understanding or a knowing that we are made of more than physical stuff, more than skin and bone. Most of us can agree on that. There's more to us than that. There's, an, there's a spirit, perhaps. There's a soul. There's a mental body. There's a, an emotional body. There, there's energy. Um, you can call it an aura, for example. So most of us kind of understand that. Now, our five senses are not normally attuned to anything beyond what our physical body is, and that's just this box down here. But theosophy teaches us there's a lot more. There are seven, six other dimensions of us. The very next more subtle, more finally vibrating dimension of ourselves is our etheric body or our pranic body. It's the energy that we carry with us. H have you ever hung out with someone that seems to be in a good mood and you can sense that? And then someone that seems to be in a bad mood and you can sense that too? You're sensing their energy. You're sensing their pranic vehicle. There are also people who suck energy. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. Psychic vampires, right? Black holes. Black holes? Like a, an energetic black hole, right? <laughs> yes, we, we need to be aware of, of people who do suck energy, and sometimes it's, it's completely unintentional, but sometimes it's intentional. Sometimes people want to, do, they latch on to you. For example, someone who likes to talk a lot. Um, we all know people who like to talk a lot. If you ever get into a conversation with someone and you try to leave and you can't and you got to go somewhere but they're talking, that, that's someone who's, who's sucking your energy, perhaps. So 
so to, to your point, yes, it might be hard to sensitize yourself to energy, but just think about it. Think about how you feel around a certain person. Think about how you feel on a day-to-day -day basis. The way you feel is your energy field, right? You're, if, if we didn't have a soul or a spirit or energy, we'd be robots walking around. Once we attune ourselves to the subtle part of ourselves, you'll get to know that ways you breathe affect you, ways you don't breathe affect you. So it's just a practice over and over. The more we do this, the more sensitized we'll, we'll, we'll become. One way you become sensitized is mm -hmm. being aware of interactions with other people. If, if you're talking to somebody and you got the first inclination that they're kind of like, you know, edging away or something, you say, well, I should probably let you go. And, and be sensitive to that and mm -hmm. let them leave. And on the other hand, if you're the one who is talking with somebody and they, you know, don't sense that you're trying to step away from that, you can probably say, you know, I, I appreciate the conversation, but I really got to get going. And don't be afraid to take charge of your life and your interactions with people on an energy basis. Very true. Yeah, so it's like if you're the one that you're in, uh, intentionally being okay with this person sucking all this energy, you're actually just leaking it out. Mm -hmm. you're not paying attention. Yep. And if, you're, if you are being uh, an honest and, uh, and a delicate steward for the universe, <laughs> you won't be afraid to say, you know what, I really need to get going. And just put it in. Because you're wasting, they're wasting your energy. person needs to talk and so you try not to just leak out your energy but to try to maybe get a little control of the conversation because they have this need. I mean, you, we know people who talk a lot and, and we have to sometimes try to maybe interject and help them. I mean, am I out of field on this or what? I would call that enabling. Oh, wow. Hmm. They, you, what you pointed out was they are needy. They need this, right. or they at least think they need it. And you're enabling that behavior. So you're not teaching them to be a good steward either. Oh, no, that's something I'll have to think about. I have a okay. friend who talks a lot, and I'm just thinking, I just try to jump I, in and get control and then change it so it's interesting to me, mm -hmm. and then I go back to her. And then, <laughs> you know, but at least try to uh, make it interesting to me, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> and and well, well, oh, sh sure. Um, in regards to uh, you know relationships or whatever, so if uh, you know we're our own being and you're your own being, you know, and we interact and stuff. So if you were to imagine an arrow that's in front of you, uh, which direction? Depends, right? That's a question for everybody. Mm -hmm. Just think about which direction is an arrow in front of you pointed. You mean if the arrow's going away from you or if it's coming to well, you? Well, it's your choice. <laughs> but it's an arrow. That's your that's your flow or, or whatever, okay? So which direction okay, so how many like people the saw the arrow pointed away from them? Like mm. than you do by your words. Uh, what was it that, uh, uh, let's see, uh, the, the 
Saint Francis. Saint Francis said, he said, preach the gospel wherever you go, and use words if necessary. <laughs> That's awesome. That's really good. <laughs> Healthy boundaries are also something to remember. When your friends need things, just understand your energetic ex expenditure as well. And that arrow, we have to be a little selfish, honestly. We, we have to replenish, and that's what practice is all about. That's what these hatha yoga techniques are all about. It's our own practice. It's okay to be selfish because just think about the oxygen mask analogy. We always use that in the airplane. Have, I'm sure most of us have heard that. You, when the pressure drops in the airplane, you've got to put your own oxygen mask on first before you can help others. That's the same with anything in life. It's okay to be a little selfish. Sometimes we feel like we have to be giving all the time or else we're not a good person. Give, give, give. No. The arrow needs to point in. It's not being selfish. It's not. It's, I'm, it's not. Yes. This is a perfect example as to why they don't interact with the world really at all. They, talk about being conservation minded. They, they conserve strictly, very, very strictly, vigilantly. They have a barrier, a huge barrier of time, of space between themselves and other people energetically. They won't combine their energy with, any, with anyone unless they know it's very effective and very carefully done. So I think we can always take clues from them. <laughs> this is a good time to reference that bumper sticker though that I do all the time. So WWJD, what would Jesus do? <laughs> but I want to make one that says what would the masters do? If in any situation in life, how would a how would a master react or act in any given situation? Well, let's emulate that as best we can. We're obviously not going to be perfect or else we would be masters right now. But what would they do? How, how would they interact with if a friend called them up and wanted to talk for 45 minutes about themselves? Would a master tolerate that? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. Would they have compassion and offer what assistance they could? Absolutely yes, most likely. So it's just something to think about. And it's not right or wrong. It's just something to be aware of. Our energy is finite. And we can increase our energy through pranayama. And we can expend it through doing good in the world. But we need to be aware of the arrow. I love it. I'm going to start. Yeah, the arrow. Yes, it goes out. But yes, it has to come back in. We have to replenish. And specifically speaking, to make it as pragmatic as possible, breathing in and holding the breath after inhale and focusing on energy building, that's how you build it back up again. That's the practice. Breathing in, holding, sensing energy, being aware of it, just seeing it. Sense your heart enlivened. Sense your third eye enlivened. And do it again. Be calm about it. That, that's the specific technique to make it as practical as possible. Sorry, I got excited. <laughs> yeah. So the energy, is that limited? I mean, uh, when you say this of energy, I mean, where does prana come from? I mean, there is, I mean, you expend it, but then there's more, right? That's where I was going with, with, with the next topic here, and we can talk about that. So prana is, it pervades the entire universe in, on all the planes, really, all the planes of existence. Every plane of our solar system has a form of prana. Nothing would live without it. It's a force, it, and it's a counterpart to shakti. So sh shakti is the main general word for energy in the, in the cosmos. And the counterpart to shakti, so the creative force, then the consciousness behind the creative force. If you're familiar with the life waves that create a system of life, a solar system or a world, there's energy and then there's consciousness. Shiva and shakti. Well, prana is kind of a subset of shakti, specific prana. It's always there, it always exists. In this book, The Chakras, Leadbeater says a lot of it comes from the sun, a lot of it comes from the core of the earth, and it's always there for our use. It naturally flows in and out of us, but we can 
we can further that process. We, just like, you know, the path of spiritual development exists for all of life. Now, you can walk the path consciously or you can kind of be bumped along unconsciously. So if we want to increase our pranic storage, we can do it consciously. We can build it. We can envision our chakras alive and vibrant. Or we can just kind of go through life and just either have some energy or not have energy. There you go. That's a great analogy. Yes. That's a great analogy. So that's why we have to keep buying things, right? We have a problem at the other end. What are we going to do with it? <laughs> Money is like manure. And Randy, I'm realizing that maybe we should have done the other microphone setup since we're having such good conversation. <laughs> oh, we, we, we could do that. Oh, oh okay. <laughs> okay. Oh. They, governments need to practice pranayama, is what he's saying. <laughs> Randy, did you, is it about money or about breathing? <laughs> Nitrous oxide yeah, tanks. And that tank has nitrogen and oxygen, and the oxygen, is, oxygen makes an explosion happen when those are in a certain ratio. And what our bodies do is create these little chain reactions with the nitrogen here and an oxygen here and a little thing between them so that there's just a tiny little explosion. And that's what movement is in our bodies, this tiny little nitrous, nitric oxygen-based explosion. And so as we're hmm. breathing, we're adding fuel to that process. We're adding nitrogen and oxygen with each breath. And we're creating this precondition. And then we have this magical system that learns how to distribute that energy in an you know, intelligent and unbelievably complicated way. But like, we're literally pulling fuel in. It's not just magic. It's not just prana. It is prana, but there's something that's locked on. 
there's certainly a physiological component that medical science recognizes about breathing. So it's not just spiritual stuff. Thank you for that. Yes. <laughs> okay. Um, <laughs> this all started from your question on how do we become sensitive a little bit more to the, the pranic aspect. So I, I hope that helps a little bit, all this discussion on how to become sensitized to the super physical aspect of, of the energy that rides, that rides on the air. But let, let's um, define a couple terms I, uh, on, on the second, sh third sh sheet here. Before we do our next practice itself, we have some... Um, vocabulary words, the top of page three, methodologies of practice. I'll just give some definitions here so when I refer to them in the practices you know what we're talking about. Um, puraka refers to inhale. Richaka refers to exhale. And kumbhaka refers to retention. Puraka, inhale, rechaka, exhale, kumbhaka, retention. So the next two also have the word kumbhaka. Antara kumbhaka and bahya kumbhaka. So thinking about retention, what do we think those two mean if retention is done with antara or bahya orientations? Sure, which is which? Which is which you think that? Yeah. So antara kumbhaka would be holding after the inhalation, full lungs, and bahya kumbhaka is holding after the exhale has been done, and empty lungs. And ujjayi, that's the restri slight restriction on the throat, a slight uh, constriction that we talked about. I wanted yeah. to uh, just say one thing about sure. ujjayi. Sure. Sure. Tell when they're falling asleep, when they're breathing, you can hear their breathing. And they, you know that they're relaxing and they're just about to fall asleep at that point. And then when they do fall asleep, they get quiet again. So 
but just be aware that that is the natural form of relaxation so that the body is able to rest. The word literally means victorious. Ujjayi means vic victorious breathing. And the reason that it's used, that that specific word is used, is because once you achieve smooth inhale and exhale, you become victorious over the fluctuations of the mind, the vrittis, the movements of the mind, when you're focused on the, on the breath. So you become victorious over the mind and emotions. Let, let, let's get a little biological here and, uh, and show you. Uh, so this is a, someone actually had their, their head chopped in half to, to show this, and it was unfortunate. Yeah, it was, they sacrificed themselves for us, <laughs> and we have a, a cross section of the of the bre of the breathing system here. So we obviously have some nostrils, and we have some turbinates, and the nasal cavity up there, and then the windpipe, esophagus, trachea. Oh, so not the esophagus. The trachea is the windpipe. So this is the muscle, the the fleshy area, the epiglottis. This is the area that becomes a little bit narrowed with ujjayi breathing. So it's the throat, it's certainly in the throat, and it's certainly audible. So it's this part of the body, the epiglottis, and the throat muscles are literally squeezing, and they're restraining, and they're, it's for several reasons. It builds heat, it builds energy. So anytime friction, no matter if it's a physical thing that's moving against another physical thing, or if it's gases moving against, or liquids, friction can be created with any matter. So even though it's air, it's gas, there's still friction happening. So heat, energy is being built, right? Energy is being created. You're working the lung muscles, the intercostal muscles are being worked, the diaphragm is being worked. And mostly, it gives you something to focus on. It gives the mind something to think about. Keep your mind on a seed, a seed thought right there. Hold it in the throat. And there's also a chakra there. There's a chakra there, Vishuddhi chakra, which has to do with vocal cords and speaking and expression and things like that. Taking it one step further, before we move on to our next vocabulary word, we have something called vayus. This is more of an esoteric teaching, and we won't spend a lot of time on prana vayus, but prana moves in the body in five different ways. And we have some notes here, which she does it on. If you turn back to page two of six, we have five prana vayus. And the fourth of the five is, is called udana, udana vayu, and that occurs in the throat. It's actually an upward moving pranic current that occurs in the throat. So when you engage ujjayi, focus on that chakra, that energetic center, there's an upward movement of prana there. It's called udana vayu. Of, vayu means wind. So prana moves in the body in, in motions, in directions. So you can think about that. There are lots of things to focus on to keep your mind from worrying about stuff, thinking about dinner later, or if we're going to make it to the airport on time, or all these different things. The mind loves to wander. Eckhart Tolle says the mind is like a pack of wild horses. Well, give, give the mind something sattvic or something spiritual to focus on, like the wind of prana in the body. Imagine prana moving into the brain, for example. So it gives the mind several seeds to think about. If your mind wanders, if you start thinking about how uncomfortable the chair is, or if my, uh, my clothes are fitting properly, bring it back to the movement of prana in the body. The, these ancient texts, the, the Hatha Yoga Pradipika, for example, tells us that when you put your awareness on the breath, it activates prana, it activates the energy there. So if you think about it, it makes it intensified. Back to the um, definitions. Well, actually, that's enough definitions for now. Let's, <laughs> let's, <laughs> let's, let's do another practice. <laughs> All right. So this, this next one that we'll do together will be guided, of course, again, and building on the last one we did. So building on pure, on pure ujjayi breathing, we're going to introduce the retentions. We're going to introduce both antara kumbhaka and bahya kumbhaka. So just a, a short retention after the inhale and a short retention after the exhale, if comfortable. We don't ever want to create stress in the body. If you find that you're holding the breath and you're kind of worried, it's like, oh my gosh, I can't, don't do that. Just do what you can. Keep everything relaxed. Keep checking in with the shoulders and the body. And just a slight retention and let the mind be focused on a part of the body. It can be on the uh, Vishuddhi chakra in the throat. It can be on any part of the body. Just make sure the body is relaxed. Okay? And I'm going to add one more, one more component here that you'll, you'll see in a minute. So let's, it'll be a surprise. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> 
All right, let's, let's sit tall. Again, just adjust the body so you're comfy. Do our little body scan again. Make sure there's nothing flexed or tensed except for the muscles around the spine. So the first thing we want to do is just start to deepen the breath. Remember that the inhales and exhales are smooth. So we're not going to engage the retentions yet. We're just going to do smooth breathing for a moment. But we will activate our ujjayi sensation in the throat. So you should be able to hear yourself. Hear, hear that breath. Now, in order to give us something additional to focus on and to make sure that our breathing, inhaling and exhaling, are smooth and consistent, we have a metronome. So notice what your comfortable duration of inhale is. For a lot of people, it's four seconds. It might be five or six seconds and make the exhale the same. So this is one click per second. So notice what it feels like to breathe in for four, five, maybe six seconds, and breathe out for the exact same. You might notice you have a larger lung capacity, maybe eight seconds. So after the duration of inhale, your lungs are full, no matter how many seconds it takes. After the duration of exhale, your lungs are empty, no matter how many seconds it takes. Once you find your comfortable duration, just continue with that. After your next inhale, introduce a two second pause at the top of the inhale. Just the inhale retention. After you've held for just the two seconds, then exhale normally, completely the same. If you feel ready to move to the next stage, introduce a two second pause after the exhale. Remember, during the pauses, notice if you're flexing or tensing anything and relax it. No stress. If you're comfortable, move into a four-second retention after inhale, 
and a four second retention after exhale. Only if it makes sense, only if it feels right. During the retentions, hold your awareness at the throat center. This is comfortable for you. Make the retentions the same as the inhale and exhale duration. So everything is the same duration. Only if it's comfortable. Please continue, holding retention after the inhale and after the exhale, a few more cycles. Please complete the last cycle that you're on, ending with the retention after the exhale. And then you can release the technique. And for the next moment or two, let's hold our awareness at the throat center still. Sense that there's energy collected there. If you choose to envision it as light or maybe a sun, a star, a flame. Move that energy that we've built in the throat, move that light down into the heart center. Just see it there. See prana, experience prana in the heart. It might be pulsating. It might be increasing each time you notice the inhale occur. Now move that same pranic 
ball of energy down to the navel, the belly button center. Just experience energy there. Now experience that same energy behind the eyes, in the head, maybe the midbrain. Please bring your palms together in a prayer pose and begin to rub the palms together. Rub them a little bit strongly so you can feel heat being built, pressing the palms, feel energy being built. Keep going, feel a little bit more, a little bit longer, feel the warmth. And now place your palms on your eyes. Sense the energy moving into the head, through the eyes, charging them up, energizing them, soothing them. And you can slowly begin to remove the palms and open the eyes. Take your time. And we're back. Okay. Any comments or experiences to share? You have a question? Okay. <laughs> 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 no. You're right. Out, yes. And then you perceive the result better. Definitely. The metro some people hate it. They despise it. And usually when I do it in a group setting, they're it's usually about a third that are like, that is ridiculous. Why would you ever make us do that? And then usually half or two thirds are like, wow, that it's cool. It gives me something else to focus on so my mind doesn't wander on the cars driving by or how warm or cool it is. It's another seed thought. But yes, of course, the advanced yogis don't use metronomes. It's just for a it's just beginners. <laughs> and it helps you get to know uh, how long it actually takes to inhale, you know, and it regulates it. So, so sometimes we think we're breathing in and out for the same time, but really we're not. We're breathing in for five or six and breathing out for nine or, or two even. So it, yeah. it's harder to hold the out breath than it is the in breath. It just gives you some additional insight. That's, that's all. And we won't do it every time. Notice I turned it off halfway through and you're like, thank goodness that thing is off. <laughs> Did you guys all hate it? Everyone hated it? Please steal it. Please. I, I didn't make it up. Please take it. Please. Please. No. And I, no. The actual definition of pranayama in the Hatha Yoga Pradipika, it's in the very beginning, one of the first, and again, it's sutras, it says rhythmic control of the breath. It's even. So the, the, goal, the, the goal is actually twofold of pranayama. In, in, in terms of Raja Yoga, which we're 
what we're all about, it's making the mind steady and calm and even. So when you learn to make the inhale and exhale smooth and even, the mind follows. There, there's another analogy that you might want to use too, which I, I stole from someone else. The, the breath and the mind are like two fish swimming in a body of water. And one fish always follows the other. We're in control of which fish leads. So if the mind is the lead fish, the mind and therefore the emotions, because every emotion comes from a thought first, which I didn't emphasize, we didn't emphasize that last night. Every emotion starts with a thought, contrary to a lot of popular belief. You have to have a thought about something first, then, you're, then the emotion follows. It's not the other way around. So the, if the mind fish is leading, the mind and the emotions are controlling the breath and then the body. So the fish are swimming, the mind is thinking things, reacting to all kinds of emotions. Yes. And then the breath is a reaction of all that, right? So if the mind slash emotion fish is leading, the breath follows. Think about when you get scared and you just freak out. What happens to the breath? <laughs> Fight or flight mode. <laughs> okay. But what happens when you're calm and relaxed? And when Terry mentioned a minute ago when we're sleeping, we're usually very smooth, even inhale and exhale. The breath follows. We can intentionally put the breath fish in front of... The breath fish, that's weird, in front of the mind fish <laughs> and shape the breath intentionally and guess who follows? The mind and the emotions. So if we work intentionally to make the breath deep and smooth and calm, parasympathetic nervous system follows suit, relaxation. We move out of fight or flight into rest and digest mode. Uh, which is a calmer, more long, it'll make our life last longer. Didn't you mention that earlier, Beth? Yeah, we live longer if we reduce stress. Think about if we woke up every morning and we did this all day. <laughs> How long would we live? Or if we woke up and we were the Zen master all day? Maybe yes, maybe no. <laughs> maybe yes, maybe no. And don't react. How long would we live? How long do the masters live? Their physical bodies last hundreds of years. <laughs> because they don't have stress. They don't <laughs> all the time. I can't picture a master doing that. So th that's the two fish thing. Oh. I just want to say real quick, as yeah. a social worker, I work with traumatized children. Sometimes, I believe, not for everybody, I think that the emotion would come first and then the thought. But I think that's probably a minority, and it may come with trauma. But even if it does, it doesn't matter. I mean, because it's like just the same. I mean, our mind and our emotions are not that. We think of them as such separate things. I don't think they're just really that separate. We, we have the analogy in our book about a person sitting quietly eating lunch in the garden, and there's a, lo a lion that slips to sleep, and they don't know it, but they do occasionally be quite <laughs> <laughs> but think about it. You before he can even perceive the thought. I mean, I, all, all I ask is that you keep that in mind as you observe from here on out and see see if that holds true. And maybe you're right, and maybe next time. Yeah, it down almost down. doesn't matter. I mean, because well, it it, it does. Uh, if you if you're wanting to understand how how life works, and so far I've noticed that. The, an emotion always comes from the thought. Now, here's one thing. It may be a succession of thoughts. It, in other words, you have built up a, uh, a habit of thinking in a certain pattern. And as soon as something happens, you have been so attuned to that that the, the reaction occurs without your even being aware of it. So the thought may have occurred far in the past. But see, uh, when you see a lion, if I was, I've never seen a lion that comes to me, I'm not scared. So this, it depends on your past experience, you know. Yeah, true. So then you, when something happens, a lion 
you see, you heard somebody and then you develop this thought or this programming, just yeah. depending on exactly. on the programming you have. Because if you're brand new and a lion comes in, you're not going to be scared if you never That's knew That's exactly a right there. Now, most of us, I, I, I would venture to say maybe 100%, if we stood around and saw a lion behind us that we weren't expecting, we would probably have an immediate reaction. Unless you love lions. <laughs> they wouldn't be caught unaware because they would feel the presence even if they couldn't see it. Mm -hmm. And secondly, they are in control of not only their emotions, but energy patterns. And they're almost completely unlikely to be attacked because they're able to neutralize those. They have abilities. We haven't developed those there yet. There are a lot of healers like that too, not necessarily masters. I want to say yeah. women, but I, that's a little well, loud. We're, we're but they're not really afraid. They don't experience pain like we do because if there is something that would cause pain, they're able to mentally disassociate from that because pain always causes stress. And they know how to almost completely eliminate stress in their life. So they have the ability to get through life that we don't have. But as Paul pointed out, they avoid everyday even even something like this, they would have to create a barrier because their vibrations are so finely tuned that these would be anathemas to them. Believe it or not, this is a pretty advanced, but they would have to create a barrier in order to interact with us. And so that's an expenditure of energy. Again, they are masters at that being in control of the energy at their disposal. Moving along to a slightly different topic, I mentioned earlier that we have two different um, compo two, two different faces of yoga, if you will. We have Raja Yoga and Hatha Yoga, so the yin and the yang, and both aim to address different aspects of our being. Raja Yoga aims to address the mind, and Hatha Yoga aims to address the body. So pranayama techniques are better suited for for one or the other. So let's let's talk about that now. On your handout, we have. Uh, on the first page, pranayama's purpose, and under that we have pranaya pranayama and hatha yoga. So in, as it relates to the physical practices of hatha yoga, pranayama has a specific aim and goal, and it's to work with energy. And that's why hatha yoga and tantra yoga are basically the same thing. Ha and a lot of times it's referred to um, tantric hatha yoga. Tantra is the energy management, basically, and so is, ha and so is hatha yoga. So when practicing pranayama in, in the light of hatha yoga, we're talking about managing energy, okay? And there are, there are three main energetic aims, if you will. And these terms come from Ayurveda. Ayurveda is like a sister science to yoga. And Ayurveda is basically the, the ancient medicine of India, the ancient medical practice of India. And so three energetic aims as they relate to pranayama and, well, actually, these energetic aims relate to every practice, whether it's asana, whether it's a meditation, whether it's a visualization, whether it's a daily activity that you do. Any, any practice falls under one of these three energetic aims. And specifically for our purposes, we're talking about pranayama exercises. So we have brahmana, langana, and samana. One is energizing, one is calming, and one is equalizing. Brahmana refers to charging you up and making, making you more full of energy for ready, preparing for activity. Langana does the opposite. It calms down and reduces preparing for rest. And you can surmise what Samana does. It makes things even. So we've already mentioned that the retention, holding the breath after the inhale, charges you up and energizes you. And we, we heard from Randy about why that is. So, so Antara Kumbhaka, retaining, retaining the breath after inhale, is bra, bra, Brahmanic or Brahmana in nature. And that also applies to extending the duration of the inhale. So we also have ratios, breathing ratios. So let's say, for example, I was breathing in for eight seconds long, 
if that's my natural lung capacity, but, ex but speeding up the rate of exhale. So if I'm breathing in for eight and exhaling for four seconds, the, the emphasis is actually on the inhale there because you're taking longer to do it. Your mind is focused on the inhale more. Eight to four would be Brahmana. If you flip that around and breathe in quickly, four to eight, and exhale for eight seconds, that would be calming to the nervous system. This is physiological. This, you prove it, prove it to yourself. Test these things. So if, if you practice meditation and pranayama in the morning, which is usually recommended, you, you do something that's energizing in nature in the morning, preparing for the day. Emphasize the inhale. Emphasize the retention after inhale. So to, char to supercharge this, Let's, let's talk about more ratios here. Eight, let's see, we can do eight, uh, four, four, zero. Breathe in for eight, hold for four, exhale for four, and then don't hold anything after the exhale. So I know I'm getting very technical here, but th it's just the idea of what we're doing, and you can, you can apply it as you wish. So no retention here, breathe in for eight, exhale for four, that'll charge you up. If you want to supercharge the effect of brahmana, add the retention. So inhale for eight, hold the breath for four after the inhale. Exhale for four, and don't hold the breath after the exhale. And of course, the ratios are completely applicable to your body's constitution, your lung capacity. It's just an example, and you can increase that 10 seconds perhaps, exhale for five. And then the same thing with langana. The shorter inhale and longer exhale create a calming effect. And we can add the retentions here. So, four, don't hold after the inhale. So inhale for, for four, no hold after the inhale. Exhale for eight seconds, and then perhaps holding for four seconds after the exhale. That really calms everything down. If you've noticed during the last practice that we did, if you were able to get the body relaxed and able to implement the holds after the exhales without feeling any stress, it's very calming. I, I, I liken it to, someone said a black hole earlier, I think that was you. It's like a void. If you exhale and hold the breath after the exhale, the mind just becomes calm and everything becomes very peaceful. That's the intention of the, of the effect of holding. Now, if you're worried though, if, if your body isn't used to that, which it might not be, it's stressful. Don't do it yet. Just work up to it. Hold for maybe one second after the exhale. But the point is to prepare ourselves for either meditation or for sleep, or just calming the... If you're a naturally super energized person, you might need to do more langana practices. In terms of asana, forward folds are langana in nature. Back bends are brahmana. Back bends charge you, the body up, they're strong. Forward folds are calming in nature. And then samana is equalizing. So th this one is very simple. One to one ratio. Even inhale and exhale. And that can be taken up a notch too. So whatever the, the, the seconds, my, my natural lung capacity is about eight, sometimes nine or 10, but usually eight. So eventually, if, if I'm just preparing for meditation, this might be my, my practice, eight, 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 and then eventually eight. So I would work up to that, of course. I would start off with just perhaps inhaling and exhaling for eight, just getting myself smooth and calm then adding the retentions and eventually it's even. Inhale for eight, hold for eight seconds, exhale for eight, hold for eight seconds, and that's equalizing. So in terms of pranayama for raja yoga, the, the, uh, um, addressing the mind, it's always this, breathing for samana, making the mind even. For hatha yoga, we can use all the different effects depending on what your intention is. Cool. Is all that making sense so far? Cool. How do we apply that to the economic system in our, in our country? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Right. All right. Let's talk about Nadi Shodhana. Nadi Shodhana. All right. That's the next bullet point on your methodologies, methodologies of practice sheet, page three of six. Nadis, that's a cool vocabulary word. Let's get to our chakra man here. Where's our chakra man? It's big. The scariest looking chakra guy I could find. He's pretty scary. <laughs> yeah, I know. 
So is Nadi a new word for most of us? It probably is. Has anyone heard Nadi before? You, you've heard it? Yes. But some of us have not heard it, I assume. A, a Nadi is an etheric, so when I say etheric, it's not physical. Modern science doesn't, doesn't know about it yet. But it's there. It's an etheric energetic channel in the body, a tubular channel. And they run throughout the entire body. And the yogis, the, the brilliant yogis of the past, who I trust, they say there are 72,000 of them. Who knows? Who knows if there are 72,000? Who counted exactly? <laughs> One of the masters did. So the nadis run throughout the entire body. And in, in Chinese medicine, they're referred to as um, um, marma, marma lines or just energetic lines in, in general. Meridians. There you go. That's what I... Yeah, thank you. So they correspond to every nerve, every vein, every system, the digestive tract, the respiratory tract, of course. The, sure, uh, the endocrine system, the, all, all the glands. So every bodily function has a corresponding nadi that goes with it because nadi carries the prana that allows the body to work, that animates the physical body. If there were no nadis and if there was no prana, we'd be just a, a literal lump of flesh and bone and fluid. We would have no life force within us. Out of the 72,000 nadis, there are three most important ones. And the three most important ones are displayed here. All right, two of which start at the nostrils. So that we have a left, left uh, uh, chandra or, or um, ida is what it's referred to. It has two names. Ida, nadi, is the left side. It starts at the nostril. And the right nostril is uh, either refers to the sun, uh, surya, or uh, pingala is the other name for the, the right side nadi. So... Ida, Pingala, and then the middle one is Sushumna. So the Sushumna Nadi corresponds with the spinal column, and Ida and Pingala start at either nostril and then move up through the brain and down the spine as well. And that's what our chakra man is, is displaying here. So each time the three Nadis crisscross, there's a vortex of energy, also known as a chakra. There's seven of them, seven major ones, 49 total minor ones. Different traditions talk about different numbers. And someone mentioned Kurt Leland earlier. I think you, you did, Gary. I've learned so much from him. Um, and I love that the TS is broadcasting all the lectures from Alcott on YouTube now, because I watch so many of them all the time. Not while I'm driving, of course. But, <laughs> but Kurt Leland, if, if anyone's curious to hear a really great lecture on chakras, he's, Kurt Leland has done an amazing job of researching different traditions. Some traditions talk about different locations for the chakra. Some, uh, in Leadbeater's book, he has one over in the spleen instead of right above the, so the um, <coughs> excuse me, sacrum. And why different traditions talk about chakras in different locations and what their purposes are. So Kurt Leland is a great, ex uh, a great resource for that. But roughly speaking, the three major nadis crisscross at seven major locations where energy happens in the body. And energy is received and transmitted. And uh, medical science recognizes that there are Plex, plexes of, enter, of nerves at most of these as well. So it's not just spiritual. It's, there's a physiological component. So the root chakra, the, the um, second uh, sacrum, sacral chakra, the navel center, the heart chakra, the throat, vishuddhi, and then the third eye, or ajna, and then the sahasrara, the thousand, thousand meridian or petaled lotus at the top of the head. And the reason why they're referred to as lotus flowers or petals is because they radiate energy. They receive and transmit. And the radiation looks almost like petals of a flower. So that, to clairvoyant sight. So 72,000, three main ones. One most important one, which is the sushumna. So um, sun, moon, and then the sushumna is referred to as fire. Fire, because that's where the kundalini energy raises when we're when our character has has been developed to such a an extent that we can consciously utilize kundalini energy the fire or the lightning power of kundalini is activated for us then that's where the siddhis come from but they don't it, that, that doesn't happen until we're prepared and we need to purify our entire being so, so that we can handle that kind of power and we were talking earlier about some some people who have that awakened prematurely and it's not usually a good thing at all when it's awakened prematurely. So it's, a, it's actually a cautionary statement. That the Pradipika gives us a cautionary statement. Don't awaken Kundalini before you're ready. When are you ready? When you're pure. 
not only physically healthy, but pure of mind, pure of conscience, conscience, and you have the ethics and necessary morals to handle some power, some fire, serpent, lightning-like power that rises through the Sushumna Nadi when we're ready for it. I'm giving you this background because we're, we're going to go into our Nadi Shodana practice. So Nadi means energetic channel. Shodana means cleansing or purifying the Nadis. So it's a preparatory practice to eventually have more energy flowing through our Nadis. So how do we, practice, how do we cleanse the Nadis? We do alternate nostril breathing. So that's closing one nostril, breathing through the other, then closing one, then breathing through the first. Nadi Shodana, cleansing the Nadis. The, the Ida and Pingala, left and right side, and it, the intention is to purify the channels in the body. Do we need a short break, or should we do, should we do that? Let's do it. Let's do it. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I know, that's true. We only have 20 minutes. All right. This is good stuff, though. All right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> so we're all gonna look like that when we're done. <laughs> Piercings all over and <laughs> grow some long hair. Exactly. <laughs> all right. So Nadi showed. Has anyone done alternate nostril breathing besides Sandy? Has anyone practiced this before? Oh. Where did you learn, if I may ask? What, what tradition? <laughs> Oh, ah, okay, very good. I think even naturally, sometimes the nostrils one like closes, the other one opens. It just happens naturally. It does happen naturally. But yeah, it does. If you do for a little while, that cleanses. It does. Eventually, that will go away. I believe. Before we move into it, though, I want to give you another thing. There, there's so there's so much to talk about regarding this this pranayama thing. We mentioned briefly bandhas earlier. And during the retentions, if, if we are going to supercharge, if we, if we intend to make these things more powerful, you can squeeze different parts in the body. And physically, whenever you squeeze a muscle, you build heat in the body. But uh, spiritually speaking, you conserve energy as well. And this midsection of our body is thought to be our pranic container. And prana swirls um, in, in this area, and you can contain it. So the, there are three main energetic locks, if you will. A banda means uh, a restraint. Uh, bondage. You're, you're binding the, the energy. So there's a throat lock, there's a root lock, and a midsection lock. So it's, they're very simple actually. The, the root lock, the very bottom one, is this, it's the muscles that you use to restrain your urine flow. Similar to that. You're constricting. It's almost like an upward lifting motion of those muscles. And, when, and those are used in, in yoga asana and in pranayama. And it, contain, it, it prevents Pranic leaking, you guys were talking about. It sounds kind of wrong to talk about that, but <laughs> it's, it's kind of appropriate to say it that way. But yeah, and the same thing with, with so um, the, the, the root lock is um, Mula Bandha. The chin lock is referred to as Jalandhara Bandha. And the way we practice this one is it's very simple as well. The chin moves a little bit down and a little bit back. And the yogis tell us that this is preventing upward leakage of prana containing it in the midsection. And then we talked about the diaphragm area, or the area above, slightly above the navel. And it's, it's just the midsection. This is called Uddiyana Bandha. And it's literally a pulling in and up of the abdominal muscles, in and up. So you can experiment and explore these during the retentions. And talk about supercharging the effects, it really does. So we have lots of ways to make pranayama subtle, just breathing in and out, perhaps or making them supercharged with retentions and then adding bandhas as well. So energizing yourself in the morning, brahmana, inhaling, holding after the inhale and engaging all three bandhas and just holding. That's a lot of energetic buildup. And then releasing, e exhaling, then inhaling, doing it again. And of course you can practice with one or two or maybe all three, whatever works for you. It's depending on the effect that you want. All right, now we're gonna add this alternate nostril thing. So it's usually done with the right hand Traditionally, it's your choice, but typically with the right hand. And the thumb of the right hand will close the right nostril gently. And this is when we breathe in through the left nostril. And then the last two fingers, and Iyengar teaches that uh, in, his, in his book, Light on Pranayama, he talks about that the pinky is kind of a weak digit, so use, use two and press the, the left nostril down. And so those two close and open each nostril. 
there are different schools of thought on the peace fingers. Now, I ha happen to enjoy, I like placing my peace fingers on the third eye. It gives me an anchor point. Some teachers say that that's not good because it draws the attention there when you might be focusing somewhere else. I don't know that I, it's the personal preference. It gives me an anchor point. Kind of like when I'm playing the guitar, or if, if anyone's an in, a musical instrumentalist, you like to have an anchor point, your fingers touch the guitar and you can pick that way. That's kind of the same thing. You just hold your f fingers there and use your thumb and last two fingers, or not. Or you can fold your piece fingers down. It's completely up to you, but then your arm is just kind of free floating out here. Yeah? So before we go into our practice, just try it one time. Just try closing the right nostril and just taking a deep, smooth inhale through the left all the way in and then exhaling through the left nostril. And then change sides. Close the left, open the right, and just take a deep, slow inhale through the right. And exhale through the right. Good. So get to know that feeling. Now, the techniques are varied, as you can imagine. The Pradipika teaches specifically, and I, I actually have the sutra from the Pradipika here um, on your handout, the last one, Sutra 2.6. This is the actual scripture from the Hatha Yoga Pradipika, which describes Nadi Shodhana, alternate nostril breathing. And the yogi Swatmarama in the 1400s, when he compiled this text, he tells us to inhale through the left and exhale through the right, then inhale through the right and exhale through the left, and repeat. Inhale left, exhale right, inhale right, exhale left, inhale left, exhale right, inhale right, exhale left. So I'll guide us through that, that technique. And usually when you start on one side or the other, it has an energetic effect too. The left side of our body is usually referred to as the moon aspect or the feminine nature of ourselves, cooling, calming. And the right side of our body, the, the pingala or surya nadi is referred to usually as the masculine side or the heat, the hot active side. So when he has us breathe in through the left first, it's naturally slightly langana in nature, calming. But you can certainly breathe in through the right first. But the way it's formally taught in the Pradipika, it's inhale through the left. So we'll do that together. And after several cycles, we'll add the retentions. And it'll be up to you if you want to add the bandhas as well. So the duration will be up to you, whatever's comfortable. So I'm curious to know, was anyone comfortable with four seconds? Or was, are we, do we all have a larger capacity than, f than four? Was four, even with the metronome, inhaling. So that's full lungs, by the way. Inhaling full lungs for four seconds, is that what we're... Or was anyone up to six or seven or? Yeah, whatever's a comfortable duration. Yeah. Oh, ten then. Oh, okay. Yeah. 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 You're right. You'll notice though if you're a little bit energized or perhaps a little bit nervous or stressed out about something, it'll be less. You got to be relaxed, and then you'll know that you, that's how we can hold our breath for four minutes eventually. Okay, so close to 10. What, what was the consensus, though? I'm just curious to know. I, I did six. Okay, yeah. yeah. About six, seven? Oh. Okay, is it like four? What is it? Three? Three. Okay, that's, that's perfectly fine. Okay, good. All right. It's completely up to you. I, I won't use the metronome again if you, unless you really want me to, but we'll, <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll move into this Nadi Shodhana practice. So let's... Let's do it together, and I'll guide us through it, of course. So sit tall, relax. <laughs> All right. And there's traditionally not an ujjayi component during uh, alternate nostril breathing, but you can certainly add it if you want. It's just one more level of intensity. So move towards deep and complete inhale and exhale again. Okay, bend the right elbow and either use the peace fingers as the anchor at the third eye or keep them folded in and close the right nostril with your thumb. Inhale through the left nostril. Close left, 
exhale through the right nostril. Inhale through the right nostril. Exhale through the left nostril. Inhale left. Exhale right. And continue at your pace for a few more cycles. Inhale right, exhale left. No retentions yet. It helps to focus on the third eye center during alternate nostril breathing. Making sure the breath is smooth and even. So the next time you exhale through left, you'll inhale through left and add the retentions. Just two seconds after the inhale and two seconds after the exhale. You can keep the nostrils closed manually if you choose or not. So at least three cycles of a two-second retention after inhale and exhale. Three complete cycles. Don't let me rush you, but after you finish the third cycle, increase the retention to four seconds after inhale and exhale if it's comfortable for you. And if you choose, add one or more of the bandhas during the retentions. Experiment. Keep the spine tall and the shoulders relaxed. <laughs> Sense that you're balancing your yin and yang nature. You're harmonizing yourself, balancing your lefts and rights, your ups and downs. Have the intention to become harmonized. Have the intention to become even.
Let's do two more complete cycles of inhale and exhale through both nostrils with the retentions and if you choose the bandhas. There's no rush. After your second cycle, just lower the hands to the knees. Now as you let the breath equalize, just Become aware of the spinal column. It's actually helpful, perhaps, if you gently rock your body a little bit left and right, just less than a centimeter left and right. Sense the spinal column, your central channel, your sacred stream of energy in the body. Once you're able to kind of just become sensitive to that place of your body, just be still again. Become aware of the spinal column and see it as a stream of energy. Become aware of the very base of your spine, the coccyx area. And then notice the very top of your head, the crown chakra. And sense that the Sushumna Nadhi, the central channel of your life, life force, connects those two points, the base of the spine and the crown chakra. So now that we've practiced alternate nostril breathing, let's add a meditative kriya, a movement of energy up and down the spine with the breath. So you don't need to shape the breath, just notice the body inhaling and exhaling and move your awareness from the base of the spine to the top of the head as you notice your body inhale. And then move your awareness back down the spine as you exhale. You're moving your awareness with the breath. At the same time, you're creating a pranic flow up and down the central channel. This is purifying your nadhis, purifying your life energy. Slowly the awareness moves up the spine on the inhale and down the spine on the exhale. Just another moment or so.
Now just be still. Notice the energetic landscape of your body. Slowly lower the chin and begin to open the eyes. Okay. Any thoughts or comments on that you'd like to share? <laughs> Please. <laughs> Wow. I just got chills. That is so cool. Yeah, it was really important. It was an important breath for me, especially in the beginning of teaching because I was so nervous about being in front of people. And that was the thing that I relied on to help me calm down. See, it works. It, it does work. And if you if you're skeptical about it, just try it. it. It's a technique that's been used for thousand, more than that, millions of years even. Different civilizations have used hatha yoga techniques. It's not just invented by these guys in the 1400s who wrote the texts. But Beth, did you have a comment? Oh, good. So I thought that was interesting. I thought that meant that he did actually do something. Mm -hmm. When you have the intention, energy flows. Where you put your mind, energy go energy goes there. I, I used a little version of a zinc instead of like making the energy flow. It was like using a thinking straw, where all you do is reduce the the atmospheric pressure. And it <laughs> automatically comes out. That's cool. I like that. Mm. And then you inhale through that straw again as slowly as you can. And I thought I only did it like you know, two cycles or something. But the guy said, okay, I'll come back. And okay, what was your experience? And I was, I mean, it was, he was into a full state of dream state. I, I was like, oh, there's no doubt for this. You know? Yeah. <laughs> it was yeah. Just <laughs> she had me it made me more close to her head. She was so upset and, and the point.
course, everything falls away. You don't hear the clock. You don't hear everything when you focus that way. Is it internally you understand that it's just Pardon? Is it internally she was losing it? No, no. You, you can actually tell in, in your head. And oh, you close your eyes. You close your eyes. And it's uh, Eckhart Tolle uses something similar, you know, in, in doing something ever so slowly. Uh, you just take it in steps. And you do this with a stone, with your eyes closed, and bring it to your forehead, and you lose track of all time. It, you can be doing it for 10 minutes, and it seems like you're, you just barely started. Can you do it in miracles, you mean? Mm -hmm. Yeah. But it, it, what it does closed. is because you're actually doing something, everything else disappears because you, you, you're focused on that one simple thing. She could not break through the energy? No, no, she, she, she thought that, you know, she would go like this, and because she was focused on it, she wasn't anywhere close to finishing the whole process in 10 minutes time. No, she was totally, she absolutely got there. It worked perfectly for her because she was completely focused on it. She's used to getting paid by the hour. <laughs> If you were curious to see in writing what we just did, we did three different stages in the practice. The first one was inhale left, exhale right. That was the alternate nostril piece. Then the second stage, we added the kumbhaka. We added the retention after the inhale and after the exhale. And then we added the bandhas if you chose to. And I know that's kind of a new thing for probably a lot of us, but it, it increases the, ener the, the energetic effect. Yeah. All right. It's 12, almost 12, 10. That was our flight. <laughs> I, I have something else I want to share with you guys. There's, there's one more technique that I was really hoping to get to, but Terry and I do this every time. We always talk too much, and we just have to come back next time. But there is one more technique that I'll just describe it. There's not enough time to do it, unfortunately, but I'll describe it. Um, it's important, and it's very, very cool, and it's relatively esoteric, and I've done a lot of yoga training and I've never been exposed to this technique anywhere except for in the school that I've been training with. And these books that I, a couple of the books that I've showed, that I've shown you here are from that tradition. So this, this book, and then last night I had um, something, uh, let's see, the, the Secret of the Yoga Sutra by Pandit Rajmani Tugunaya. That lineage and this lineage teaches something here that, that I'm going to show you in, in just a minute. So in the next few few minutes I'm going to just describe this process. So going to the methodologies page again, three of six, <clears throat> the one under Nadi Shodana is Kapalabhati. That one I gave a really quick demonstration for earlier. It's the, ex, it's the rapid exhalations by way of pumping in and out of the stomach. So it can be done nasally or orally through the nose or through the mouth depending on the effect and it looks like this. Very Brahmanic, it's very energizing, very solar plexus focused, very fire building, very transformative. So it can be done again through the nose or through the mouth. That's Kapalabhati, and the actual etymology means skull shining breath. Is it in and out like that? There is an inhale that occurs, but it's not emphasized. The exhale, the exhale, exhale, exhale. Obviously, you're, the body is taking in air in between each exhale, but the exhale is emphasized. Yes. Yes. And it's a very common technique. Uh, min many physical yoga classes use it. Sandy's probably used it before. It's usually done at the beginning of class to charge you up and get you ready. It builds heat, physically and ener energetically. The next one, bastrika, on the second column, top of the second column, bastrika means bellows breath, like a bellow, the air thing that you use to, to stoke the fire. Bastrika is kapalabhati times two. So bastrika is equal inhale and exhale emphasizing. So instead of the inhale being um, a reaction, they're both emphasized, so it's actually like a double the effect. So... <laughs> double the effect. Now, there's an ujjayi component as well with bastrika. You're constricting a little bit. It, you want to hear that. It's almost like a, a, a saw. You know those 
old fashioned looking l lumberjacks that are going back and forth with the saw thing. That's what's happening. And, it, and the, the yogis in, in, in the text, they teach this as like a shaving, like you're shaving something away, thinning the nasal, pa uh, thinning the air passage and shaving. So let, let me show you, okay, let me skip a few. Prachardana. Okay, skip down to the second to last one on the second column. Prachardana is this special technique that I want to show you. And I had to tell you what Bastrika was before we can talk about Prachardana. Prachardana is taking Bastrika and moving the location of the Ujjayi. So, this is the esoteric part that I think is really, really cool. So, we talked about earlier how Ujjayi occurs in this area in the throat. So remember Kapalabhati and then Bastrika, it's the inhaling and exhaling, kind of sawing or shaving. We can actually move the location of the Ujjayi based on the different muscles that are being constricted. Most of us know what snoring feels like, right? That kind of thing. Some of us do it without wanting to do it. Well, that's almost like an involuntary Ujjayi, but it's a higher, it's, you're moving this, the constriction or the, the flesh that is being combined or controlled, it's being moved higher. So snoring happens up here near the uvula, the soft palate area. Well, you can do that intentionally for a different effect. So does anyone know what structure in the brain sits in this little bony saddle right here? Exactly, the pituitary gland. All right, the pituitary body is right here. And there's also a pineal or pineal gland that's a little bit farther up and back, but yes, the pituitary body is here, very close to the area of, of the sinuses and the soft palate. There's a little bit of bone there. There's a name for this saddle. I've heard it referred to as like the Turkish saddle or something. It's, it's a different, uh, it's, it, there's a name for it, but the gland sits there and it's said that the Ajna chakra has its seat or its root at the pituitary body. And this technique of prachardana, we, we, we say that they're on the, we think of the chakras as being on the surface of the skin, but if you read Leadbeater's book or study some different esoteric teachings, the chakras are, they have, if it's a flower, the root of the flower is actually in the spine or in this case at this physical structure, the pituitary body. So the process of prachardana is taking bastrika, and ujjayi and moving that to the area of the soft palate, the uvula. So instead of constricting down here, we're constricting the muscles and the flesh up here. So bastrika, meaning the sawing or shaving, in and out, in and out, in and out. Nostrils, so the air is moving in and out. This area is being constricted. So what happens there? Vibration. Why is this area important? Because it's very close to the pituitary gland. So the intention behind this technique is to stimulate your Ajna Chakra. Very cool. And this is one of my favorite practices and techniques. It's literally creating heat, light, energy, prana at the third eye, at your center of clear vision, viveka. Ajna means command center. It means that it's your control for life. If you can activate that chakra and have it work purely and clearly, the yogis tell us we will have viveka, we will have clear sight, clear vision. That's why this technique is very, very important. So I'm going <laughs> to leave you with that. <laughs> and you can exp experiment and explore. And ne next year when Terry and I come back, it, if, if it does work out, we'll practice prachardana. But it's the idea of breathing bastrika style here, thinning the air passage so the pituitary gland and thus the ajna chakra is stimulated and activated. All right. Yay. <laughs> Yay. <laughs> okay. So pranayama. Should we talk about pranayama a little bit more for the next few minutes? Or are there any last points we'd like to bring up? Or anything on here that you want additional clarification? Sure. Um, oh. Breath of fire is Kapalabhati, from my experience. Yes. The exhales. Correct. Um, in yoga classes, different schools of yoga, different traditions call a lot of these things different names. But yes, breath of fire is Kapalabhati. Exhale, exhale, exhale. Yeah. All right. These reading techniques, no, 
not so much in our book. Our book is more about what we discussed last night, Raja Yoga. This is part of, this is a preparatory though for Raja Yoga. If I didn't make that point though, all of the physical yoga techniques, everything, pranayama, asana, cleansing of the physical body, it's all preparatory. It's all to purify the physical body so then we can practice Raja Yoga and control the mind. Yeah. All right. Namaste, everyone. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.